at some point when I was in uh, secondary school in year nine, we were given an English assignment to develop a, a game. And I think the, the point of the exercise was to develop the rules that we were able to then communicate with the rest of the class. And at some point, like Genie, one of the kids that I guess had been in there with me since since year seven appeared in front of me and uh, basically told me that we were going to be working together on this. And his name was Simon Harvey. And we spent the next four years pretty much inseparable after that. He, um, he was very into Warhammer, uh, Space Marines. Uh, I think we're going to see some some big things on the, the cinema in the near future with that. Uh, Henry Cavill potentially taking on a lead role. But at the time, it wasn't that well known. Certainly I hadn't heard of Warhammer before. Uh, the term Space Marine was something that maybe I'd heard of him in, in a different context, but not something that really meant a lot to me. And I got drawn into this world of White Dwarf magazine and uh, captured my fascination, I guess, in a way that I'd already had his. And we became really good friends. And I can remember the actual exercise delivering it to the rest of the class. Explaining the rules to everybody, and obviously Harvey knew the whole thing way better than I did, and he'd set up his figures for uh, for success, his miniatures, and we just went along with this thing that wasn't rehearsed, uh, and I got absolutely thrashed. <laughs> I'm sure he he thought that was absolutely brilliant. The class were enthralled; they thought it was really interesting. Uh, the teacher seemed to be quite happy, and I think we both got good marks. But I, think, I suppose that was the, the gateway into, into his world and really interesting on reflection that we must have been in the same class for two years before then and I don't think we probably said two words to one another. So it very much felt to me like, like I'd been adopted, like I'd been taken under his wing. He was somebody with a reputation in the school that I probably hadn't really heard of, but he'd come from one side of, of town, I'd come from the opposite side of the town. Uh, he had friends that were at St. Peter's School, or from St. Peter's School, which had a bit of a reputation as being quite rough. He lived in South Bank, I lived in Eston, uh, and the school was probably the, the halfway point, Gilbrook School. So we hadn't known one another before secondary school. Um, yeah, he could he could throw fists like uh, nobody else I'd ever met. And there were a few times when we got into punch-ups with, not with one another, but with other people, where it was clear to me that he was somebody that would never back down, uh, even when he was considerably smaller than the guy he was squaring up against. That's something that I always respected about him. Uh, he loved his family, he loved his brother. <laughs> in fact, I can remember his, his brother Paul was in the army and somehow Simon had got hold of a, a plastic bullet that he used for riot control. And it's something he kept in his pocket at all times, I think, partly because it reminded him of his brother, but also partly because he could wrap his fingers around it and it made his punch bit more solid if we did end up getting into a, a scuffle with somebody. And at some point, I think in 1993, I went on holiday with my family to Ireland, so that was me, my brother, my mum and my dad, and I can't remember if it was while I was away or when I first got back, but I heard the news that that Harvey was seriously ill and of course I went to see him in fact I think when I got back home he was already in hospital uh, and I arrived at the hospital not knowing really what to expect he was I think on a, a drip of some kind or regularly on a drip wearing his hospital gown uh, there was a mutual friend there uh, that was keeping him company and I can remember him being allowed out of the room and I don't know whether it was because he couldn't walk or because he 
he was just really tired or just because it was fun but I remember carrying him around the hospital on my back like piggyback and one of the members of staff commenting that uh, we were obviously good friends at some point over the course of that next year I had to go to see my GP for something or other and I think I'd just got to that age where my parents trusted me to get on the bus and get to the two towns over to the GP and get myself back again and I can remember sitting in front of Dr Chowdhury who was a family doctor in a way I don't think we really have family doctors anymore he knew my family for several generations uh, my parents and my grandparents and I think my great grandparents and so he was somebody that certainly had my trust and like I say I don't even remember what the appointment was about but I remember it coming on to the subject of, of Harvey um, my friend that was ill and Dr Charity asking uh, what kind of cancer Harvey had and me telling him that it was a teratoma and his face kind of changed uh, and he said it's a really aggressive form of cancer um, and it turned out that he'd developed this tumour in the arteries, veins, around his heart and lungs. It was something that was inoperable. And we were told that if the chemotherapy didn't work, I can't remember if we tried radiotherapy, maybe, but if, if those treatments didn't work, then there was not a lot that, that would be able to be done for him. So, that was a pretty bleak moment for me and I think the moment when I came to the realisation that you may not survive and that was a, a lot to take in as a, a 16 year old At some point on the, uh, I think 12th and 13th of August in 1994, I finally plucked up the courage to to talk to a girl I'd really liked for a long time. She was somebody that had moved into the area from overseas, from Ireland, although her parents were English, and you never would have known that she lived in Ireland from her accent. She sounded like she from southern England. Uh, her dad was a vicar and they lived in Vicarage which was certainly the biggest house that I knew of in the town I lived in, in Eston, in Middlesbrough. And Verity and her sister Katie held this house party, well garage party really. And I'd finally plugged up the courage to tell her I'd liked her for a long time and uh, I was pleased that the feelings, the sentiments seemed to be mutual. And Verity said to me, let's put a pin in this and talk about it tomorrow. I think she was aware of the guests that she was ignoring at that point. I completely filled the dog up with popcorn as I was sat there, one for me, one for the dog trying to work up the nerve to have this conversation but Harvey was there that's the thing I remember that uh, this is a year after we found out about his diagnosis and we've got photographs of that night that were taken by a friend uh, another Simon they had them printed in this kind of sepia colour which made them look very old fashioned almost like we're kind of growing up in 1960s, 1970s Russia, something like that. So it was strange thinking that less than two weeks after that party, partly to change my life,
going. I remember the last time that I that I saw him at his parents' house in South Bank. I think I'd gone to visit with Verity's dad, who, like I say, was a vicar. And I think the acknowledgement was at that point that he had gone home to die. And so Lance, my now father-in-law, was the vicar that was going to take the funeral. And I think he wanted to talk to them about any wishes uh, for the service. I think he also wanted to pray with Simon. And he told me afterwards that he had prayed with Harvey and Harvey had com made a commitment of some kind uh, of faith um, to Jesus. And I think that was comfort to his parents, but it was certainly comfort to me as somebody who had become a Christian the year before. Um, and my faith was a huge source of comfort and strength, right in a really pivotal moment of my life. Growing up, 16 years old, and trying to figure out what it was that I thought about the meaning of life and the universe and existential things and I think that was part of the part of the route into getting to know Verity better as well over the course of that year, 16, 17 years old getting to know her parents a little bit as well at church But the last time I saw him, like I say, we were at his house and he was lying on a mattress in the living room. And I don't remember what we talked about. I think the adults were talking. I don't even know if there was an acknowledgement at the time that that would be the last time that I would see him until I got up and started to leave. And I stopped halfway through the door opening into the hallway. So on one side of me I could see the hall, on the other side I could see the living room and him lying in the mattress. And I looked at him, he looked at me. Uh, and it was kind of, I guess, a soft smile on his face. And I hope I smile back at him. And I think there was an acknowledgement in that moment that that would be the last time we saw one another this side of glory. So he died on 25th of August 1994 he was 17 years old I'd been 17 for less than a month I think it was five days later on the 30th of August that I carried his coffin into the church, the church where I would like to get married to Verity, and then carried the coffin back to the hearse, and then from the hearse to the cemetery. And then I would lower his, 
this caution into the ground. And then for nearly 30 years, I never went back. I can't quite explain why. So to get to school, I had to walk through Eston Cemetery pretty much every day, every school day. And at that time I was an air cadet and desperately wanted to fly fast jets. And so I would walk past the row of war graves in Eston Cemetery, again, pretty much every day, because it meant something to me. And it was a reminder to me of the thing that I might commit to, i.e. the military, and the risk of losing my own life, and needing to be certain about the reasons why. And I didn't know at that time that further down the same row as the war graves, Harvey's grandparents were buried. I think they both died a couple of years before he was born. I'll say his grandmother died before, a couple of years before he was born. His grandfather died quite a long time before that. And it's a really, really strange to think that after all those hundreds of times walking past, at some point in the future, he would be laid to rest in that same place. Kind of life moved on. And after the funeral, Verity and I, we went off to a Christian festival, like a, a camp. We were there for four nights, five nights, however long it was. We came back and we got on with sixth form college and then university and then marriage and then more university and having children. And although in my head I had a rough idea of where in the cemetery it was, it was buried, I guess time distorts things in your mind. And then just recently, Verity was staying with a, a mutual friend who said it's coming up to 30 years since, since Harvey died. And she wanted to go back and pay her respects. And would I be doing the same? And I guess every year I think about how old he would be on his birthday and I think about him in August I don't think it really registered with me that, that it would be 30 years this year So the day after I turned 47 Verity and I got in the car and we travelled north from where we live in Sheffield back back to where we used to call home in Middlesbrough and thanks to the wonders of the internet we found we found the register of burials at Eston Cemetery and we knew which plot he was in and getting out of the car on the, the 4th of August literally walked straight to his grave, having not been there for three weeks short of 30 years. 
And I realized when I got there that I had never seen his name on the gravestone. Um, and that was a really sobering moment. So today is the, the 25th of August 9th. 2024, not 1994, it's 30 years since 1994, so it's 30 years today since, since he died. So I'm just going to go back and say hello. See how I feel. Maybe tell him what's going on. I'm hoping that this process of really looking at looking at grief, what grief is, what it means. I'm sure it means different things to different people and there are common elements and overlapping elements. But I think for me is not even seeking closure because that implies kind of cutting myself off or the end of something. The way that I found out that he died was by a friend's mum arriving at our house, very upset, saying that her daughter was hysterical, inconsolable, and would I go and see her, would I go and talk to her? And I don't know if I thought about it afterwards, but I've been thinking about it over the past few weeks. But that moment to take stock about what what I'd just found out, what I'd just heard, what had happened, was kind of pushed under a rug. And I certainly think on reflection that I took on a role of delivering that news to people. I didn't want anybody to find out over the phone, any of us close friends. And so I think I spent the rest of that day walking around and talking to people that I thought would appreciate being told face to face and consoling people and I guess in some ways that made me feel useful um, yeah I think I think a lot of what Harvey and I did together was based around commonly held views on honour and integrity and we read a series of books together, the Dragonlance Chronicles and there was particular character in those books. His name was Sturm, S-T-U-R-M. Uh, he was a knight uh, of a particular order and whenever one of the knights were killed they would read out the Song of Humour, I think. It's a long time since I've looked at the book. When Harvey died we went to um, went to see him. I don't know if you, his body sounds really morbid. Um, and there was a couple of things that I wanted to leave with him. Uh, one was a belt, a belt buckle, 
that I managed to get. It was a limited edition thing relating to Warhammer, uh, something that he wanted but couldn't get his hands on. And I decided that I would give my belt buckle to him. So that was a very strange experience for me, for me handling his body in the least invasive way I possibly could. I cut, cut the belt to be able to wrap it around him. But I think on reflection, that was quite a lot for a 17 year old. Uh, I also wrote a couple of notes that I put into his jeans pocket. I think one of those notes was the Song of Humour. Uh, and another one was... My final words to him. And I think some promises I made to him. One of which was to live life for the both of us. So when Verity and I went back to the cemetery on the 4th of August this year, we stood in front of the grave and, and V said to me, how do you feel? And I think I realised that for 30 years I've kind of carried a grief that I've not really started to really unlock or tap into. His death changed me without a doubt and it wasn't until Grace was born in 2002, our firstborn that I can remember really crying. Yeah, crying like I hadn't cried in a long time. And I think even then in, in 2002, I felt that I'd started feeling again, maybe after what, eight years of trying to keep a lid on what I felt. And I guess there is a, a strong belief that men don't cry. That's not something that I necessarily ascribe to. I saw my dad cry when Harvey died. I saw, saw his dad cry. Of course I did. He lost his baby boy. So standing in front of his grave, if he asked me, what do you feel? The only thing I could say was, was guilt. It's a guilt of, of moving on and leaving somebody you love behind. Even though the rational part of me knows that he's no longer physically here. It's 
so I, I guess I haven't really got much further than that other than making the commitment to go back and to spend more time at his grave and to do a bit of thinking and a bit of processing. I think today part of heading up to Teesside is to is to go and see if I can find his parents as well. I think they would be in their 80s. I think his mum may be in the late 70s. But again, there's kind of a guilt associated with losing touch. A guilt associated with um, them not knowing that I still think about Simon Harvey. I think about him all the time. If I'd lost a child, I think part of the, the hurt would be thinking that he would fall from people's memory. And maybe it would be some comfort to know that there are still people thinking about them decades later. People still feel the hurt of the loss. But also remember all the, the good stuff from the good times as well. listening to a podcast over the last few days called The Line uh, about an incident that occurred around a group of Navy SEALs US Navy SEALs I think in Iraq a part of that podcast they're talking about the, the mentality that drove many many civilians to join the military after 9-11 and something that's touched upon in the film American Sniper, I'm not sure whether it's whether it's in the original book form as well, but the analogy of the the sheep, the sheep dog and the wolves. And the sheep are the general population. The sheep dogs are the protectors of the sheep and the wolves are the people that would do the population harm. And of course, the Navy SEALs, and I'm sure all branches of the military see themselves as the, the sheepdogs. And interesting, <laughs> interesting that Harvey did have a dog, and she was called Tess, and she was a sheepdog. You know, but it made me think when we were talking, Verity and I were talking three weeks ago. I think on the way home, after we'd been to the cemetery, and I think I was trying to explain the loss of somebody that that means so much. And I'm blessed to have a lot of friends, a lot of people in the community, a lot of men specifically, uh, that I I'm very fond of them. And I'm, I'm sure that they are fond of me. That's certainly the way that they act. And then I've got a close group of friends that, yeah, male friends, I would say, I, I genuinely love them. I, I know them. I know that they love me because they've told me. I also know that, uh, 
there are some relationships in your life that are irreplaceable. The, the person can't be replaced and the, the place that they take in your life, it just can't be filled. And I just had this picture in my head of, of being captured, trapped somewhere in a dark room, tied to a chair with my hands bound behind my back. And hearing outside uh, a ruckus in the hallway and you know maybe it's things being smashed and people in, people in pain punches landing and Saint Devi uh, in this image if I hear shots fired when the door opens I'm expecting to see the silhouette of some some guy from the SAS that the British government sent to bring me home. But if there's no shots fired, when the door opens, I would equally expect it to be the silhouette of my dad. Because I know the commitment that my dad made when he knew that I was on the way to the world is the same commitment that I have to my children. And I've told them wherever they are, if they need me, I will, I will go to them. I will always go to them. There's another podcast that I listen to a guy called Bedros, I think. I can't remember his surname. It begins with a K. And he's he's saying how. He's got a close group of friends that if he rings one of them in the middle of the night, I think one in particular, and says, uh, hey man, I'm in trouble. The other guy will just ask two questions. Where are you? And do I need to bring a shovel? And there are no other questions asked. It's really rare certainly be rare in my lifetime to find friends that are that committed to you. Yeah, that would, they would be willing to lay down their own life for you. And so going back to that picture of being in the dark room and the door being kicked through, one of the people that I might have expected to see in silhouette would have been Harvey. And he knew that equally the other way around, I would always have gone after him. So I think that's another aspect of the grief. It's lose somebody that that would have come after you for whatever reason regardless they would have overcome whatever obstacles were placed in front of them because of the value that you held in their lives and so it's cruel it's cruel for the person that's gone It's also like an unfathomable loss for the people that are left behind as well.